Hi, I'm Sean Hammond with PremierGuitar.com. We're here in Nashville, Tennessee at the Gibson USA factory, and we're about to go in and take a cool tour where you're going to see every piece of a Gibson made. Every step of the process is pretty cool, pretty intense, and uh, I think you'll dig it. Let's go inside. Okay, Jim, so we're here in the... You have a few different buildings here at Gibson. We're in the mill, I guess you call it. This is called the rough mill. And we're, we have rough blanks of all sorts of wood coming in here. And tell us what's going on behind us, or in front of us. We, we take our raw materials. All our, our wood stock comes in, as you can see, in large pieces. And we take the lumber and we rip it down into the appropriate size uh, materials that we need, whether we're processing neck blanks or guitar body blanks. What are we looking at right here? Right now, we're looking at raw mahogany lumber. Uh, the, when it's this size, it's most likely going to be uh, guitar body blanks, and then he'll cross cut that into the smaller sections. From there, they'll, they'll get further processed and surfaced. Along the, the processing, as we saw earlier, when they're uh, ripping and cross cutting the blanks into smaller sections, now they're uh, doing the same thing but churring up the edges so then they can be glued up. They're marking them as they cut, come off. So they're, they're grading them and marking them to see if they'll yield a two-piece body or a three-piece body blank. They look at the, the quality of the wood. If they see uh, certain uh, imperfections, mineral streaks or knot holes, those are cut out. The smaller pieces are then put to the side uh, and culled, and then they utilize those to determine if they're going to be in a two-piece blank or a three-piece blank. Now we're looking at our glue clamp. As you can see, it, it rotates so it can uh, accommodate a, a very large uh, quantity of body blanks. By the time they're filled and loaded, then they, uh, you know, there's that glue time is kind of built into that operation. And then they start to pull them off and stack them. Looks like you could probably fit, I don't know, what, 100 on there or something? Actually, the capacity is 118. The roller uh, has glue in there, so they run it over that, and that applies the glue, and then they're stacked into the clamps, and then they have uh, the pneumatic clamping uh, where it's tightened down pneumatically, and then they have another uh, clamp or fixture that makes sure that they're pressed down. It's uh, pretty amazing when you see him pick up the blanks like he just did, he had three body blanks that he all picked up and put the glue on and just kind of tossed them down. And he's been doing it for so long, you can see they don't shift. He knows just how everything is to be aligned and uh, he can operate it you know, with incredible efficiency. We're just using an aliphatic based wood glue. Uh, we've used it for many, many years, uh, tried and true and industry standard. Here we have a pallet of tops that are glued up. So these have just been glued, but they're not yet thickness sanded. You can just see they're, you know, it's immediately after the gluing operation. So are these book matched maple then? Yes, these are book matched maple. Two piece tops. How many tops can you get out of that? Because it's fairly thick. That's like a little over an inch thick, it looks like. Is it still just one top? Yeah, yeah. Each of those will would be one top per guitar. So here, he's taking a pattern and penciling out the body perimeter and then bandsawing them. You can see he has five or six at a time and he'll rough them in on the bandsaw all at one time to prepare them for the, uh, being milled on the NC machine. And what that does is remove a lot of the excess material which makes the NC operation a lot more efficient and uh, it makes it easier on the machine as well. The bodies are heavy enough, they're just stacked on top of each other, there's no pins or anything. And uh, the pattern is oversized, so he's just roughing it in. Our new weight relief here that we're looking at. It's this is on the new standard that was unveiled at Music Mesa 2012? Yes it is, the new standard in studio will have this new weight relief. It's a little bit more solid through the center as you can see. Uh, we've done that uh, because some people uh, requested that it was more solid. They were afraid that maybe the chambering affected the tone and maybe uh, affected the sustain, the sustain and, and maybe feedback at high volumes. So it's more solid, um, yet still weight relief. The chambering was used on our 2008 uh, Les Paul standards and studios. 
Uh, and then the uh, traditional route, which is a series of holes, is used on our Les Paul Traditionals. Now, this 2008 one, is that still being used on some models? We're still using that on uh, the 2008s that we still have orders for that we're still making. How did you guys arrive at these different patterns? We use CAD programs uh, that are, uh, allows us to analyze how much material is removed and uh, we can use that information to determine where we want to remove it and uh, design around, uh, like for instance, the long slot you see is our switch uh, access cavity. So that way we don't have to drill a hole that is milled from the top. So we use that, uh, you know, the CAD program allows us to see that and design it from the beginning. He's feeding the tops into the uh, glue roller. As you can see, right now that's applying the glue. The top that has glue applied is then loaded into the clamp. So all the, the bodies are loaded and stacked in here, and then the hydraulic clamps come down and glue them all together at the same time. Before the top is applied, has the locating pins, and then the top has the locating holes, and that keeps the top and the back from shifting as they're glued. Right now, this is our Northwood CNC body router, and we're routing SG61 bodies. We have five heads running at one time, and we have two tables. We'll run the, the backs on one side, and then we'll flip it over and run the tops. Everything you can see with CNC is very uniform, very precise, very efficient. We've had these uh, since the late 80s, I believe, and uh, like you said, it is the norm for the industry now, uh, Gibson were certainly early uh, in acquiring these uh, machines and technology. Depending on the model, some models are a lot more extensive than others. Um, the average cycle time is probably five to ten minutes, depending on the model, and that's you know that's a total accumulated time you know from doing both sides. We have all the different cutters that rotate, uh, so you don't have to have separate. Uh, set up times and uh, delay things you know the they're on a turret head that's what, and uh, they rotate depending on the operation required for that body or different sized bits and everything correct some will be drills some will be different sized router bits or shaper heads you can see right now they're using a, a small router cutter and it's doing an operation for the control holes called interpolation and that means they can use a smaller bit and program the diameter of the hole so they don't have to have a separate drill for each of the, the holes required in the body. For instance, the, the toggle switch hole will be larger diameter than the pot hole. So this will just interpolate that hole with one bit. So this mahogany lumber that we get in is size, uh, rough size for our neck blanks. It's a lot smaller than our body blanks. So it will go in the kiln for a specified period of time until the moisture content is uh, at the level where we can process it. The wood is stickered. You can see the little uh, slats of wood in between uh, the neck blanks. The spacers. Or... Yeah, the spacers. And uh, they're called stickers and, and they're used to allow airflow between the wood blanks. So that way the drying will be even throughout the thickness of the material. Here are um, another of our various kilns. You can see wood of different size, you know, are processed here. Uh, it just increases our capacity and, and can better utilize the kiln process for specific sized uh, raw material. That's actually water vapor that we use, use to environmentally control our facility. You'll see that in the rough mill and you'll see that in our other plant as well. We constantly monitor moisture content in the air and depending on the climate and what needs to happen, we'll uh, have the vapor turned on for a period of time, and that will get our humidity level to an acceptable level, uh, depending on the time of year or the day. You can see the neck blanks are, are roughed in on a bandsaw, and then the peg head ears are, are matched and then glued on to the sides. After that, they'll be ready to go on to the rotary profiler. We'll use maple neck blanks on anything from some of the Melody Maker models to some of the Les Paul models. This is the rotary profiler that we're using to process the necks. So you can see the neck blanks are rough bandsawed to size, uh, similar to the body operation that we saw. So it just removes a lot of the excess. 
and they're loaded onto the rotary profiler, which will further shape the backs of the necks, get them down to a more manageable size, cut the peg heads down, and kind of rough it in closer to the finished size. As it goes through uh, the operations, there's actually a couple different operations happening where he'll take it out of one fixture as it cycles through, and then he'll pick it up and it'll be clamped in another fixture which will do another operation. Different gang drills for different peg heads are used. So uh, you can see here there's six in the line which like would explore, be for Explore, so. um, Firebirds, and uh, guitars of that nature. And then the three and three, and some of the three and threes uh, could be for different size peg heads. We have an SP1 and an SP2, which are slightly different layouts, but still the classic Gibson kind of design. So you can see he's using a shaper table with an incredibly large cutter on there. And he's roughing in the neck with that. You can see the peg head coming down to shape. That's another old school method. Again, depending on the model, determines on what gets what process. You can see that the, the neck is clamped to the pattern and the pattern has a guide that it follows. So at the bottom of the bit, there's something that's moving along the edge of the yeah, pattern and the base of all this. The bearing on the bottom of the cutter. Right now we're watching the truss rod assemblies installed in necks. It's a conventional compression rod that we've used for years. Now it's so widespread, virtually every company that makes guitars uses a truss rod, and that was actually a Gibson invention. So he's installing, after the rod, he installs the spline, which is the strip of wood that presses down on the truss rod, and that's glued in and clamped, and then uh, profiled down. So that it's flush with the rest of the neck? Correct, and then the fingerboard can be glued on. Here you can see the clamps after the truss rod splines are glued in, they're clamped in all these clamps here. Now we're in a different building than the mill we were just in. This is where the bodies and the necks come to be put together with the other components, sort of uh, the more finely tuned stuff. And we're starting out looking out, looking at um, a big pallet full of fretboards, right? Yes, this is called Grenadillo. It's a Guatemalan rosewood. We're using this on various models. Very similar to rosewood, but a little uh, harder. Uh, color is very similar. Grain can have a little bit more figure. So it's kind of in between a, a conventional rosewood and ebony. A little bit brighter than rosewood because it's a little bit harder, uh, but not quite so much as ebony. From there, it's gonna go into another one of our kilns. And uh, once the moisture content is stabilized, then we'll take it out of the kiln and then it will be run through the processes. Here we're gluing in the top dots and the fingerboard inlays. So again, it's, it's one of those operations that just has to be hand done. These are uh, acrylic top dots that he's gluing in. We'll use acrylic and we'll use uh, plastics and uh, sometimes wood. This is the small block inlay used on our SG. It's a little bit smaller than the Les Paul Custom uh, or CG style block. So the glue is applied and then she's hand inserting the inlays in and then they'll be uh, tapped in and allowed to dry. After the fretboards are radius, they're run on the fret slotting machine. You can see it's a turret style affair where uh, the pneumatic clamps and all the fingerboards are loaded onto the machine and as it rotates through, there's a arbor with various saw blades that slots all the fretboard slots at one time. So it just cycles through. You can see our, our different arbors for different scale lengths, various guitar scales and bass scale length. Long scale bass, short scale bass, and then uh, we use primarily 24 and 3 quarter, but we also do some models with 25 and a half inch scale. Here we're looking at our fretting operation. We have uh, the frets are tapped in by hand to get them located in the slot, and then the hydraulic press comes down and uh, presses the frets in place. After that, they're trimmed, flushed with the edge of the fingerboard. After that, some models uh, that have binding, the binding will be applied, and then uh, other models that don't have binding will proceed on. This is an RFID tag that is installed on all our guitars. Uh, we do this to allow tracking throughout the facility and uh, for us to monitor that everything that uh, leaves the door is uh, accounted for and uh, is, as far as inventory and uh, allows us to also verify, we could verify internally here whether it's a, a guitar that we actually built here. After the, the fretting operations, the necks are prepared by getting the peg head veneers glued to the faces. You can see here, they're loaded into a pneumatic clamping uh, fixture. 
after the glue is applied and then they're clamped and uh, until ready to process. After the peg head veneer is glued on, then it'll move across the, the aisle here and have the fingerboard glued on. The fingerboard has glue applied and then it has locating pins that locate it on the neck and then it's loaded into this pneumatic uh, gluing fixture. So it's kind of like a series of fire hoses. So instead of using one clamp or a, a, a series of clamps, you have one clamp that's a air pneumatic control clamp that applies uh, the air to these fire hoses that press down on the back of the neck. Again, it's a lot more consistent pressure, which gives it a lot better clamping operation than a series of clamps. Another one of our NC machines that we use here, our neckline carver is done. Some necks, even though they're machined at the other facility at the rough mill, they may have additional neck carving operations done here, such as maybe a final peg head shape or uh, the back neck profile. Some models may be common at the other plant, but once they get uh, uh, done at this operation, they'd be more model specific. So once the fingerboards are glued on and the peg head veneers are glued on, the nuts are glued on, all the, the other prep work is done on the necks, they come over here and they still have uh, a sanding operation that has to be done because you have tool marks or the edge of the neck that extends from the fingerboard has to be flushed up. So a lot of that is still done by hand and these, uh, again, it's a highly skilled hand operation. After the bodies are machined at the rough mill, they come up to this department and they're run through various sanding uh, operations. It could be edge sanding or uh, fine sanding the top contour or the back uh, profile. Some models then that have binding, uh, the binding would then be uh, rabbited, uh, which is the, the routing around the perimeter to a channel for the binding and then have the binding applied. They each, each station is kind of specific to that operation. So you have a, a slack belt sanding operation that would be used on a Les Paul where it's contoured on top. So the big slack belt uh, is flexible enough to allow the operator to press that sanding belt across the contour of the top. Some sanding operations may have a, what we call a rolling pin sander as it looks like a sanding roll on a pneumatically controlled spindle and that allows the operator to kind of get in all the nooks and crannies and irregular uh, surfaces around the perimeter of the guitar. Here we're watching the binding be applied. As you can see, it's a very old world method of applying the binding. Gibson's done this ever since they've been applying binding. It's one method that Gibson's kind of known for. It's like a canvas rope that will use it again repeatedly and at certain points it has to be replaced, but you can get numerous uses out of it. And it's just wrapped, as you can see, very tightly. The glue, the glue is applied to the binding and they start the wrapping process. They'll get that first uh, wrap done and locked in and then they just start wrapping it, going around the, the body perimeter kind of like you're wrapping a cheese wheel. Body binding is a, a ABS in, for most bindings that we use. The glue needs to be able to melt into that material and bond it to the wood. So it has to, that glue is specific to this operation. So how long do these hang on these racks here? Once, once they're wrapped, they'll hang overnight. So they have to completely dry thoroughly and that's just the nature of that glue. Here we're at the neck fitting operation. You can see a neck has the glue's already been applied and he's clamping it in. Now he's taking a toothbrush uh, with some water and, and wiping off all the glue residue. Prior to that, the, uh, the neck heel, if needed, it has to be chiseled. Uh, again, this is still a very old school, labor intensive method of doing a, a neck attachment, but it's really the best way to do it. It has to be eyeballed because every piece of wood is a little different may have a little tiny lip here or there. Yeah, even though the, the neck and the body are both uh, NC machined, uh, you still have to hand fit each individual one for a proper fit. Sometimes uh, you may have glue swelling or, or shrinking or uh, maybe, uh, you know, through the process it just needs to be fine fitted for a proper fit. So he'll make sure that it's flushed off on all the surfaces and then fine fit the neck to the body. After the necks are attached, they're put on this carousel so it gives them a place to dry and it's very uh, space efficient. Once they're dried, then they're put on racks, given another inspection and then uh, sanded on the spindle sander here to flush up the uh, neck with the body joint. 
At this point, what we do here are the pickup cavities and maybe bridge location and, and uh, different bridge cavities. In the case of, uh, you know, most of our models will use a stop bar uh, and tunematic. Some of them may have tremolos. Uh, some models, like say we have a Les Paul that could be common up to this point, this routing operation would determine which model it is. Here we're in the PLEC room. We have eight of these pluck uh, machines that dress the frets and polish the frets. So the instruments are loaded in. We have various fixtures depending on the model uh, that will hold them properly in the machine. They're scanned to find out you know, if frets are high or where they're at. Uh, after the scanning process, it, it uh, will then go back one by one and level and crown and polish all the frets. Uh, completely computer controlled and very accurate. How long does it take to go through the plug machine, the entire process? The entire process is about 10 to 12 minutes. After the instruments come out of the plug room, in color prep, uh, the, all the final sanding is done and all the wood filling prior to being uh, allowed to go into the finishing department. So d again, depending on the model and on the color, uh, when it gets into the wood filling, we may have a cherry wood filler or a walnut or a natural and uh, that that is basically kind of a a milkshake thickness uh, wood filler that's applied to the wood surface and, and kind of uh, rubbed into the grain to fill the pores of the grain. For one, it uh, highlights the grain and makes it uh, kind of accented uh, in the finish operation and it also packs the grain pores to prevent the filler, uh, to prevent the finish from sinking into the wood grain. We're entering our finishing department now. Uh, right, right now we're in the uh, scraping and uh, in-between coat sanding area, but you can see the guitars, they're in the middle of the finishing process. You can see the guitars on the carousels uh, uh, cycling above us. So in between coats and operations, they right on that carousel where it's warmer and that helps the finish cure and it, it uh, in terms of material handling is a lot more efficient than keeping everything on one level and uh, less actual physical handling. How much time does each guitar spend on the carousel going along the ceiling? It depends on the finishing operation. Some finishes, in the case of a high gloss, uh, the, the entire process time may be four to six days in terms of actual finishing and then there's dry time. Uh, some finishes in the case of our satins or, or worn finishes may get a few coats of satin and a color coat and they may, may be in and out of the finishing area in a day or two. She's uh, measuring the film thickness on the finish build. It's another one of our QC steps within the department. So we will spot check and monitor within models or batches the material thickness to make sure that uh, not too little or not too much is applied. You don't want it too, uh, too thick. The, the thicker the finish, the less the wood is going to vibrate. Uh, too thin, it's not going to last. Uh, you know, it has to be durable. That's certainly a valid point there. And, uh, and within processing, it has to be thick enough to withstand buffing. So you have to have enough material that you can sand it and buff it. We still do that with silk screen, just like we did in the old days. Uh, some models will have a silk screen application and some models uh, may have you know, a mother of pearl or acrylic inlay, uh, just depending on the model. But in the case of our classics, where it called for silk screen, we still use silk screen. Here Ray is actually doing a sunburst that he's doing by hand. You can see it's uh, a very skilled operation. You can't automate that kind of thing. So are all of the sunbursts done by hand like that? Yes, everything we do, is, and we have a variety of sunbursts. So not only do you have to be on top of the model, uh, being that it's a hand operation, you have to get a feel for how that spray gun has to be angled and, and held on a particular model. And then you have different colors. Uh, you know, here we're doing the uh, VS, which is a, a tobacco type brown. Some, you know, some shades are uh, iced tea or cherry and variations of each where they're a lighter color and it requires a different skill or a different feel to be able to uh, apply those sunbursts. Here the guitars are having the top coats hand applied. After they uh, get the sunburst on or shading, uh, they'll get a seal coat of clear before they get on the electrostat line. All the operators here are hand scraping all the binding on the bodies and fingerboards. 
So uh, we don't mask anything uh, with the nature of our finish. It really has to be a hand scraped operation. Very, very highly skilled and uh, very detailed. She's using a, a scraper blade and they have to keep those sharpened and uh, they'll, they'll replace them. You can see the files uh, where they sharpen their blades uh, numerous times uh, you know, throughout the, the day or you know, as, as needed. The training is uh, very difficult because you have to have such great eye and hand skills and a lot of these folks have been here on the line for years and years. After finishing, the instruments are brought into the neck prep area, and here, what we're doing is removing any finish that may uh, overlap onto the fingerboard. Even though it's masked, you're gonna have a little bit of residual finish that needs to be cleaned up. As you can see, they're scraping the finish off the very edges of the yeah, fingerboards. Very meticulous. Very meticulous, absolutely right. And uh, after they do the razor blading operation, then they come back with steel wool, and then, uh, polish the fretboard and the frets with the steel wool, which further removes any uh, tape and finish residue. So after the guitars are processed in the neck prep area, they're brought into buffing, and uh, at this point they're buffing out the finishes. You can see they go through three su successive grades of uh, buffing compound, starting with the red wheels, that's the coarsest, going to the yellow and then to the white uh, buffing wax. And each wax, uh, you know, removes the scratch from the previous wax. And what we're doing is uh, sanding and buffing out all the uh, imperfections in the finish, all the orange peel uh, that, you know, is just part of the finishing operation is fine buffed here and uh, given its final luster. In the center of the room, uh, we have our final inspectors. And as the buffers put their guitars in the racks uh, upon completion, the inspectors then pick them up and look for any uh, scratches or any issues that uh, you know may necessitate them to get buffed again or uh, if, if there's a finishing problem that uh, they discover at that point then it will have to be refinished or repaired. After the guitars leave the buffing department they're brought in here uh, they're given another inspection and cleaning here uh, we clean and oil the fingerboards and we also give the guitars a final polish and inspection uh, before they're issued to the line for assembly. Here is where we wind and build all our pickups and all our control assemblies. They'll generally load up about 10 pickup bobbins uh, to be wound all at the same time. That ensures it's a lot more accurate and efficient at the same time. We've uh, been making our PAF humbucker style pickups uh, pretty much as we've done since the 50s, only now they're a lot more accurate. Uh, we've, over the years, have gone back and done various reissues. Those are all the same. When, when you're winding the uh, pickups all at the same time like that, uh, they're all done to the same number of turns, and so you want to use the same gauge of wire. Uh, in this case, they would be PAF styles. Even within the humbucking, we'll have a, a dozens of varieties of winds and wire gauges that we use. Now you can see the coils all being wound at the same time. It's the, the, the count, the turns are automated and the traverse, which is the uh, side to side motion, is all automated. So everything is as accurate as can possibly be. After the pickup bobbins are wound, the pigtails, which are these short wires, are attached and then the pickup coils are taped up. At that point, then they can go down the line and then get built up and assembled. They'll install the uh, pole shoe, the screws, the magnets and the base plate. After the pickups are completely assembled, we'll give them a wax potting operation that uh, allows the wax to permeate the pickup assembly. Uh, you, the idea is that the uh, wax can penetrate the coils and prevent, once, once it's cured, will prevent the coil from vibrating, which is what uh, causes feedback. So it makes the coil uh, less prone to feedback and a lot more durable because it's going to be less susceptible to any kind of moisture that could uh, cause any kind of oxidation within the coil and uh, just dampen any kind of vibrations. Here we're building up all the control assemblies. We have various stations. Uh, maybe at one station we install leads onto pickup selector switches and then we may have a station that installs all the pots onto the uh, control plate assembly. Step by step it just gets built up all into the complete electronic harness. After the guitars are uh, given their cleaning and fretboard cleaning and oiling, uh, they're issued to the line. And here you can see the line. Uh, the guitars are built up in various stages. 
They're installing the tuners, the bridge, the electronics, and uh, all the various components until at the end of the line they're ready to have the uh, strings installed and uh, tuned and uh, the setups. So once the guitars are, are primarily assembled, then they get over here and uh, the setup guys will then install the bridges, the tail pieces, and strings and then uh, give them this, the preliminary setups. Here we're in the final cleaning and inspecting department to get the final cleaning and inspection and uh, truss rod cover installation and back control cover installations. Uh, we leave them off at, until this point so we can get in and clean all the nooks and crannies and, uh, and we also do any kind of spot buffing or shining that may have to happen. We're here at final inspection. RP is one of our final inspectors that has been here for 19 years. Uh, he has a great deal of experience. So he's looking at uh, not only the playability, but the cosmetics and uh, running any kind of quality controls. If, if something doesn't pass, he'll flag it and stop it and it will have to be uh, dealt with accordingly, depending on the situation. He'll, he'll test everything uh, from the electronics, uh, function, uh, sound, and uh, playability, you know, action height, pickup height, neck adjustment, and uh, all the finishing uh, quality control that needs to happen. He's doing a bend test right now, so every, not only will he play the notes all up and down the neck, but he'll bend them just to make sure that uh, there's not going to be any notes choking out uh, during bends. There he's initialing the tags, so after inspection they'll initiate, initial it. So uh, that's their sign off that everything is okay. Then it can proceed to get uh, put in the warehouse and packed uh, or stored until it's ready to get packed and shipped. Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to show us around the whole factory. It's been really cool to see all the different steps and see so many drill-worthy guitars. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take one of them. Now, Anyway, thanks again, man. Thank you. We're glad to have you. You're always welcome back, and we enjoyed it, too. Cool. Thanks, man. For more information on Gibson Guitars, go to Gibson.com. I'm Sean Hammond. Thanks for watching PremierGuitar.com.